Hello hockey fans and welcome back to another video. Due to the economic impact of the current global pandemic and the NHL's decision to enact a flat salary cap for the foreseeable future, teams across the league have begun to take a closer look at their finances and look for ways to save money both on and off the ice. This urgent need to cut spending has led many organisations to make notable roster changes which may not have been necessary under normal circumstances, such as trading away productive yet highly paid roster players for a noticeably lower and cheaper return, or buying out the remaining years of a player's contract in order to save a chunk of change in the short term and spread out the cost over several more years. Of all the buyouts that have taken place this offseason, none seemed more logical than the Nashville Predators buying out Kyle Turris. After all, the Canadian centre was set to earn $6 million a year for the next four seasons, yet he has produced at a point every two game pace since joining the team in 2017, a far cry from his multiple 20 goal or 60 point seasons earlier this decade. So how did Turris get to this point? Why didn't things work out for him in Nashville? Why was he bought out just two years into his six year contract? Well in today's video, we're gonna try and figure it out, as we attempt to answer the question, what's happened to Kyle Turris? Let's start by taking a look at Turris's entire NHL career up until this point, so we can see what led to him signing such an expensive contract, and why things didn't work out for him in the long run. The third overall selection of the 2007 draft by the Phoenix Coyotes, Kyle Turris would spend a year at the NCAA's University of Wisconsin before joining the Coyotes roster for the 08-09 NHL season. Though he would produce a decent rookie year thanks to potting 8 goals and 20 points in 63 games, the Canadian forward would find himself in the AHL with the San Antonio Rampage for the following 09-10 season. That said, Turris would notch 63 points in 76 games in the minors and soon be back on the Coyotes roster for the 10-11 season, where he would improve on his rookie year ever so slightly by scoring 11 goals and 25 points in 65 games. As his entry-level contract came to its conclusion on July 1st, 2011, Turris and the Coyotes were unable to come to terms on a new contract. With the 11-12 season soon approaching, the restricted free agent was absent from Phoenix's preseason training camp and was forced to hold out until a new contract could be agreed upon. With Turris rumoured to be looking for a yearly salary in the 3-4 to $4 million dollar range, and with the Coyotes allegedly playing hardball, given his decent yet modest production for the team, Turris's agent announced that his client had requested a trade from the team. In doing so, Turris's agent made it clear that this decision wasn't about the money. His client wanted the opportunity to move forward in his career and have a fresh start elsewhere in the league. After months of speculation and with the December 1st deadline creeping closer and closer, a deal was finally reached on November 22nd, 2011, as Turris signed a two-year, $2.8 million contract to remain with the team. That is, until he was traded less than a month later. On December 17th, Turris was shipped off to the Ottawa Senators in exchange for defenseman David Runblad and a 2012 second round draft pick. So after months of tense negotiations, Turris had finally got the change of scenery he wanted, while the Coyotes picked up a former 19th overall pick and a second rounder for the following draft. Not the best return for Phoenix considering they gave up a third overall draft pick in the deal, but the player exercised his rights just as much as the team did. Such is the business of professional hockey. Once he had moved across the northern border, Turris would quickly become a legitimate top two centre for the Senators and garnered a reputation as one of the team's most productive forwards for the next half a decade. In parts of seven seasons with Ottawa, Kyle Turris posted three 20 goal seasons and three 50 point seasons en route to notching 117 goals and 274 points in 407 games, serving as an alternate captain of the team between 2014 and 2017. Not only that, Turris would also be a key contributor in the playoffs too, as he potted 21 points in 35 postseason games, including 10 points in 19 games during the 2017 playoffs to help Ottawa come one win away from the Stanley Cup Finals. As the 17-18 season got underway, and with Turris entering the final season of a 5-year, $17.5 million contract, Ottawa were looking to bring some new faces onto the team and retool their roster. Given his $3.5 million cap hit and his strong production over the last few years, Turris was a likely candidate to be traded during the season as he would fetch the Senators quite a haul in return. 
After putting up 9 points in the first 11 games of the season, it was announced on November 11th, 2017 that Turris had been traded to the Nashville Predators as part of a three-team deal which also included the Colorado Avalanche. If his move to Tennessee wasn't big enough news for you though, immediately after joining the Predators, Nashville quickly signed Turris to a six-year, $36 million contract extension worth an average annual value of $6 million a season. Now that's how you make a grand entrance, folks. Upon his arrival in Nashville, Turris would continue his strong production that he had with the Senators and find a comfortable home in the Predators' top six, as he scored 13 goals and 42 points in 65 games to conclude the year, bringing his full season totals to 16 goals and 51 points in 76 games. Unfortunately though, Turris would disappear during the following 2018 playoffs, as he would post just 3 assists in 13 games, as Nashville were eliminated in the second round by the Winnipeg Jets. Despite this disappointing performance, Turris was only just getting started in Nashville. The former third overall pick had recorded the fourth 50 point season of his career and was bound to be just as, if not more productive in the years that followed, now that he was playing on a consistent cup contender and had adjusted to his new lifestyle in a new city. At least that's what everybody hoped would happen. Turris's first full year in Nashville during the following 1819 season would end up being a difficult one for several different reasons. Though he looked to build on his strong debut, the Canadian forward would be mired with injuries for much of the year, as he missed 8 games in late November and early December, before spending a further 17 games out of the lineup soon after due to a lower body injury. These struggles to stay healthy would have a huge effect on his play when he actually made it into the lineup, as his on ice performance had certainly seen better days and his production took a noticeable hit too. Not only would he spend too much time in the penalty box and become known as a turnover machine, by the end of the year, the Canadian forward had scored just 7 goals and 23 points in 55 games, his lowest production since his rookie season in the league a decade ago. Oh, and he was also a minus 6, which didn't help things either. So in the first season of his new six-year deal, a contract that saw him earn the second highest yearly salary on the entire roster, Kyle Turris had spent much of the year battling through several rough injuries and produced some of the worst numbers of his career. Not exactly what the team or Turris was hoping for, but there was no need to panic just yet, folks. Turris had only just turned 30 years old and would be back to his point-scoring ways once he got healthy again. He was going to play better next season, right? Well, yes and no. The recent 2019-2020 season saw a much healthier Turris play in more games and produce slightly better scoring numbers than the year prior, but he faced a completely different set of challenges instead. Thanks to the acquisition of free agent centre Matt Duchesne and the emergence of Nick Bonino as a second line centre, Turris would find himself bouncing up and down the lineup or playing a different forward position seemingly every game. This led to the Canadian forward producing a mediocre season offensively and a terrible one defensively, as he scored 9 goals and 31 points in 62 games, but recorded his worst defensive stats since the lockout shortened 12-13 season. Not great from a guy earning $6 million a year, but at least he put up more points. Oh, and if losing his role on the team wasn't bad enough, he was also made a healthy scratch for 7 straight games early in the year further emphasising that although he was healthy, his play simply hadn't been good enough to keep him in the lineup every night. Most recently, Turris joined Nashville in the bubble as the Predators looked to book a place in the 2020 playoffs, but he went scoreless in four games and posted a minus four as the Predators were bounced in the play-in round by the Arizona Coyotes. With the current financial situation and with the salary cap staying flat for the next few seasons, the Predators decided that they needed to make a big change on their roster. On October 7th, 2020, the Predators announced that they had bought out the final four seasons of Kyle Turris's contract, meaning that after parts of three years with the team and after scoring 29 goals and 96 points in 182 games, the 31-year-old had become an unrestricted free agent for the very first time and needed to find a new home for the upcoming season. So given that he was dropped so suddenly by the Predators, a team that were once so keen to have him that they made a three-way trade to acquire him before immediately signing him to his big contract, that really does beg the question, what on earth has happened to Kyle Turris? 
Why was he unable to keep up with his 20 goal, 60 point production from years prior? And why were Nashville so eager to get rid of him less than three years after acquiring him? Well, I think I've alluded to some of the key reasons already in this video, but if you ask me, there are several factors that have led to this outcome. Firstly, a lot of the scrutiny Kyle Turris faced was in relation to the amount of money he was earning while playing for the team. For example, if he continued to make the same money as his five-year deal with Ottawa during his entire stint in Nashville, Turris' performance would have been considered far less disappointing, as his production would have matched his yearly cap hit. However, given that he was making $6 million a year in each of those two seasons, and in both of those years he struggled to find a role on the team or be an effective point producer, you can understand why fans were disappointed with his play, injuries or not. Obviously, you can't blame Turris for signing that contract, as I guarantee that practically anybody else would have done the exact same thing in that situation, but with more money comes greater expectations to step up and be a key player for the team a responsibility that Turris simply couldn't handle in his final two years in Nashville. One of the bigger reasons why I think Kyle Turris struggled, though, is due to the number of injuries he suffered and how they affected his ability to play at his previous career-high level, whether he was in the lineup or not. For context, of the 218 games that Nashville played while he was a member of the team, Kyle Turris played in just 182 of them, meaning he missed almost 20% of the Predators' fixtures during his tenure. This might not sound like much on the surface, but considering the number of injuries he suffered and how long he was out of the lineup because of them, I'm sure there were many of those 182 games that he actually played where he was nowhere near full health. I would imagine that there were many games where Turris was just healthy enough to be cleared to play in the game, let alone be a productive player for the team. Obviously, the only major time spent on injured reserve came during the 18-19 season, and he only missed a handful of games in the other two years, primarily due to being a healthy scratch, but considering he was a 50-point scorer when he arrived in Nashville, and was a 25-30-point to 30 point scorer by the time he left, his numbers dropping that significantly when he started struggling with injuries has got to be more than purely coincidence, right? But arguably the biggest reason why I think Turris didn't work out in Nashville is because he never really had any stability when he was on the team. Whether it was being plagued by the injury bug during his first full year, or moving up and down the roster so frequently during his second, Turris was so unsure of who he was playing with, where in the lineup he was playing, and if he was even playing at all, that he never really got a fair shake, at least in my opinion anyway. The Duchesne acquisition and the Benino emergence meant that the coaching staff didn't know where to play Turris as they no longer needed him as a top six center. This led to Turris playing all three forward positions on all four forward lines with seven different line mates during the 2019-20 season. That's a lot of inconsistency in who you're playing with, folks. I mean, how are you supposed to establish any long-term chemistry with your line mates or have a good understanding of what your role is on the team if it completely changes from one game to the next? Obviously, Turris' lack of production played a very big part in this inconsistency, so he's not entirely innocent here, but the last thing a player needs when they're coming off an injury-riddled season and are looking to re-establish themselves as a key player on the roster is to constantly change who he's playing with and refuse to let him build chemistry with a consistent pair of line mates so he can get to know their strengths and weaknesses and help them all play better as a unit. To be honest, you could make the argument that this constant readjustment was just as problematic for Turris as his difficulty staying in the lineup due to injuries, if not more. Now some of you might be thinking that Turris just simply got old while he was in Nashville and had moved past his prime, so of course he wasn't going to be as productive as years past. However, you would be a little mistaken as Turris is just 31 years old at the time of this recording. Sure, he's starting to get on a little bit, but the prime years of his NHL career were spent in Nashville with the Predators. Just think about it for a moment, folks. If things had turned out a little bit differently, Turris could have improved on his first year with the team and perhaps played the best hockey of his entire career while in Tennessee. It's a crazy thought, right? So where does Turris go from here? Well, considering he will receive $2 million from the Predators every year until 2028, his bank account really has nothing to worry about. But the question was where he would play next season. Well, the answer was quickly discovered on the first day of free agency, as Turris signed a two-year, $3.3 million contract with the Edmonton Oilers in order to become a member of their bottom six for the next few years. Given his low cap hit, the stability of knowing where he's playing in the depth chart, and his desire to prove he can still be an effective NHL player, 
this deal could turn out to be a low-risk, high-reward signing for both Turris and the Oilers. After all, the 31-year-old still has plenty of hockey left in him from an age perspective, and he just needs to find some consistency in his game and a hint of luck from the hockey gods in order to stay away from the injury bug permanently and get back to resembling the productive player he once was. So, will Turris be able to bounce back in Alberta, or will he continue his decline even further and become a fringe NHL player by the time his new contract is up? I guess we'll have to wait and see, folks. And that's my attempt to answer the question, what's happened to Kyle Turris? What do you guys think about Turris's recent performance or his NHL career up until this point? Do you think he'll bounce back with Edmonton and become a legitimate NHL player again, or do you think he's closer to being on his way out of the league at this point? Also, is there another player you would like me to look at in this style of video? I know there's plenty of players out there that are looking to have bounce back seasons for the upcoming 2021 NHL season, so if you have an idea, let me know in the comments below guys, I'd love to hear what you guys think. But thank you very much for watching guys, I hope you have enjoyed. Please feel free to like, subscribe, share, or watch some of my other videos. Thank you very much for watching, and goodbye! A big thank you to Carl Fairbank, Chris Gadsby, Connor B, John Plomin, Jordan Whitehead, Roman from London, and Worthless Pieces for helping support this video via Patreon. If you too want to help support the channel a little bit further, and get a shout out at the end of every future video, make sure you head over to patreon.com slash oddmanrush and become a patron today.